Good afternoon. My name is Patty Utaro. I am director of the Rochester Public Library and Monroe County Library System. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all to the Central Library this afternoon to hear from Sonia Livingston and uh, Joe Flaherty, who will be introducing the program for the afternoon. Uh, Joe has been um, uh, an amazing advocate for writing and literacy in Rochester. And we are so fortunate to have had him in this community building writers and books. Uh, many of you may know that Joe plans to retire later this year. Uh, he will be turning the reins over to a new person at Writers and Books, but I fully expect that we will continue to have a very fruitful, fruitful partnership between the library and uh, Writers and Books and the writing community in the Rochester area. So at this point, I would like to ask Joe to come up and to talk a little bit about the program this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patty, and it's wonderful to be back at the, at the library uh, downtown here. Uh, before I introduce Sonia, I'd like to, if you would indulge me in what I'm going to call our NPR moment here, um, in that uh, Patty mentioned I will be retiring uh, in June. And uh, when I founded Writers and Books 35 years ago, it was never my intention that it would be mine. I mean, I took ownership of starting an organization that I believed uh, every community should have, an organization that promotes reading and writing as lifelong activities. Um, and as I you know, announced um, my retirement, uh, a number of people who have been supporters of Writers and Books said, we want to uh, start a fund to make sure that Writers and Books can continue to not only exist in Rochester, but to prosper and to uh, have a lot more people of different ages, different backgrounds participate in the programs. So they uh, started a fund called the Writing the Next Chapter Fund. And in your uh, program there, you'll see there's a little bit of a, there's an envelope here that you could fill out and, uh, and uh, contribute to the fund. Now, I mention this especially now because we have a donor, uh, a very generous donor, who said that any funds raised in the month of March, that they will match. So if you make a contribution, uh, they will match that contribution. Um, and um, they said, you know, as part of Rochester Reads, it's a great chance to go out to, uh, and talk to people who, who believe in literature, who love literature, who love this program. So um, I would just like to say, and this is very gratifying to me, that so far, uh, in this campaign, we've raised $245,000. And th to me, that's so meaningful because every single dollar of that has been from individuals. There have been no, no corporations or, or foundations uh, who have contributed. It's just been people who really believe very strongly in literature and, and, that, uh, and that writers and books and our programs should continue to, to reach people of all, of all uh, backgrounds uh, in this community. So um, I appreciate that and, and hope you know, you uh, will forgive me that NPR moment. Um, a few things to announce uh, before we begin and before I introduce Sonia is that uh, we do have a survey that we ask you to fill out that's in your program also. And uh, one of the questions we ask in there is what have been your five all-time favorite books throughout your life, no matter what age you, you were when you read it? And we're going to be compiling those and create a list of what are the top five favorite books of Rochester readers. Uh, we'll have thousands of entries uh, in that, and uh, it'll be a great intern project. We got interns, say, add them up, do all the chicken scratches, and let's find out. And then we'll announce what the top five favorite books are. Also, when you turn in that uh, survey, you will be entered into uh, a raffle to win a copy of a book called The Only Ones by Carola DeBell. Now, we do a program in addition to Rochester Reads, it's called the, the Debut Novel Series. And every year we bring in two writers who have just published their first books to introduce Rochester audiences to some of uh, what will be the great writers of the future. And Carola is very interesting in that her first novel was published at the age of 68. And which gives great hope for, for many of us. Uh, <laughs> that there is still an opportunity uh, to be involved with writing and to get a book published and to reach uh, an audience for that. Uh, the book is winning a lot of awards and um, 
It's a very interesting book, and there's copies of it back there. But she will be coming to Rochester in May, so, so look, look forward to that. Um, also, this Saturday at Writers and Books, we are resurrecting Susan B. Anthony uh, to come back and make an appearance. She's going to give a talk on Failure is Impossible. And uh, you'll have the opportunity, if you come, to ask her questions about her life and, and the tribulations and trials she had to go through. Uh, and also the wonderful things that she, um, that she did for women gaining the vote. And that is at uh, 11 o'clock at Writers and Books. So if you would like to come to that. Let's see. I think that is going to be all I have to say at this point. Also, there is a reader's guide. If you haven't picked that up, they're free at the table back there. And inside is uh, a wonderful interview with Sonia and a list of other books. If you enjoyed this, if you enjoyed reading memoir, other books that you might want to read. So you can pick them up back there. They're for free. This being our, our 35th year, um, it's kind of a wonderful, uh, I wouldn't say coincidence, but uh, a wonderful um, experience to have this year's author, Sonia Livingston, be someone who began their writing career by taking writing workshops at Writers and Books. So to have gone from that to being a nationally known writer who we now present uh, to Rochester audiences as part of Rochester Reads is really very, makes us feel very good about the fact that on the one hand, we can bring writers from around the country here. On the other hand, we offer writing workshops for young people, for, for adults, that allow them to really take their, their uh, imagination and create uh, wonderful writing and prose out of that. And Sonia is certainly one of our most wonderful examples of that. So we feel very good to be able to join these two programs together. Um, I think if you've read this book, uh, it's a bit of an unusual book for us, but certainly a, a kind of a, I, I, I want to say a genre uh, of books that is really gaining more attention in that it's a collection of personal essays that are joined together to create an overall effect of a memoir. And in it, uh, Sonia asks and I think answers the questions of, of what is memory and, and what are the memories that especially keep uh, gaining our attention as individuals? And then how do we take those memories and, and, and mine them for, for the details that are in there to then shape them into what is very uh, memorable prose that not only has meaning to, to us uh, or, to, or to Sonia as a writer, but to other readers who can see in that uh, individual acts and, and experiences, she had a kind of a universal uh, thing that all of us as humans have as experiences. And um, I want to read before bringing Sonia up here something that she that she uh, said it during an interview, and I think it's a wonderful way of looking at how she works as a as a memoirist. Writing is more like returning to an old house whose floors are strewn with litter and whose rooms are stacked full of cookie jars and photo albums and faded letters. The rubble of a life. When I write memoir, I enter that house and begin to wade through it all, picking things up one at a time, examining them, sometimes with wonder or with sadness or even regret. But looking closely, taking my time, and making note of things before setting them into their proper places and moving on. So Sonia will now be coming up to read some excerpts from her book, but also afterwards there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions of, of any kind that you might have of her, and then she'll be signing books later. Sonia Livingston. Thank you, I'm so glad to be here. Um, Happy St. Patrick's Day. I didn't wear green, but 
Chris Fanning just gave me a pin I'm subtly wearing, but um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you to Patty and Carol and Rebecca uh, with the Friends of the Library uh, for, for helping to organize this and to Writers and Books who does so much for the community. Like Joe just said, uh, my first experience taking a, re a creative writing class was with Writers and Books. And um, I sometimes wonder if I would have continued if I didn't have the opportunity to take a community workshop. I certainly didn't know about creative writing as a uh, something that you would study in school or, or that wasn't a part of my world. So it, uh, it they do such amazing things and I think they're wonderful, not just because they selected my book, but let's face it, that helps a little bit. Um, yeah, and you know, the other thing I'll say is I'm always just happy to be in Rochester because one of the things that I, I write about my own life or the experiences that interest me, but I always think of uh, Rochester and Western New York as my most favorite character. So um, I always hope that I'm representing the region in a good way uh, because certainly it has it has my heart. So just three minutes ago, I settled on which what will I read? There's so many things that I could read, but I I'm gonna um, read four essays, and, and normally that should scare you, right? Because essays are long, but uh, m many of them are very short. The first one uh, is a memory from sixth grade at number 33 school. So I'll start there. Joe, you didn't, where's Joe? Oh, okay, I didn't mean to call him out, but he forgot to say that Susan B. Anthony is gonna be at Writers and Books this Saturday. She's gonna be, she, did he say that? Oh, I was shuffling through deciding which one, okay. All right, with that lovely start, I will begin. Mythology. Now comes the sound, soft and thumping as a human heart. Who can say whether it's source as a teacher as he walks around the classroom tapping the eraser of his pencil against the palm of his hand, or whether the sound comes as it often does from the classroom next door? The teacher one class over has a full-blown crush on the state of Hawaii. He wears shirts covered in hibiscus and returns from school breaks with brown skin and a stack of records he uses to teach the girls in his class how to hula. The sound of drumming slips under the door and into our classroom so that a sway sometimes starts up in my hips. I imagine his girls learning to move their bodies like palm trees in the breeze, and only when I'm safely home do I allow myself to replay the music in my head while turning my hands into birds and watching them take flight. There's no dancing in our classroom, no red hot hibiscus, no coconut scented oil. There's only Mr. Coyle, whose plain dress shirts are topped with ties so short they become stubby arrows pointing to his fleshy midsection. Ties that give him the look of a father from a TV sitcom, the sort who might have an outburst here or there, but who means well and who must rely on his TV wife to set him straight. Rachel Zazzo says that Mr. Coyle is Italian because his last name ends in a vowel. Rachel wants everyone to be Italian, and she's my best friend in the class, so I indulge her, though I wonder why the E in Coyle doesn't bounce like the vowels in Travolta or Bertinelli or Savoia, the pastry shop a few blocks away from number 33 school. Rachel sits in front of me, her ponytail so tight it pulls at the edges of her eyes. Next to her is Tammy Dinkins, and how to account for Tammy, whose father is black and mother is Italian, but whose last name ends in an S. And what of my own last name, which ends in a full stop N, but has nothing to do with who I am? Still, I like rules, especially those geared toward the unlocking and understanding of people, so I consider once again what Rachel has said about vowels, and is it possible that this is all that remains of sixth grade? But no, here comes the teacher, his shoes making soft contact with the floor, arms folded, pencil moving against his hand as he surveys the classroom. He stops from time to time, bending into the flat carpet to remove a scrap of paper or to neaten a pile of books stacked along the wall of windows. Our desks are joined into long rows and we sit, girls and boys contemplating the rectangles of lined paper before us. When he nears my row and stops tapping, I turn pink and pick up my own pencil, as if I've just that second thought of something to write. The truth is, I've been racking my brain since he gave the assignment, and now it's too late. He's in front of me, leaning into my blank page, as if checking to see if the words have been written in the very faintest shade of lead. How's it going? he asks. His question is gentle, but I slink under its weight. 
I'm the one whose work is normally done while he circulates around the room, offering a thumbs up or encouraging comments to those who have trouble starting. But now it's as if someone has taken up the classroom globe and spun it hard, leaving me to lurch inside the circle of it, treading the hollow places under the mountain ranges of Central Europe. The assignment is to write what we want to be someday. One of the most ordinary questions of childhood, yet it seems I've never been asked. Maybe because I'm one of seven kids in a family headed by a woman without a husband or a career, and we live in a neighborhood brimming with similar women, people who didn't plan as children to wait tables or clean hotel rooms or stand around on porches or corners watching as the world passes. Maybe no one asked because I seem to have it all figured out. I do well in school where answers to questions about the 13 colonies in the Nile River Basin sit like easy treasure inside textbooks. School problems are a universe onto themselves, and I can always be counted on to be the girl with the right answer. But this question stops me, this question whose answer lies in the murky world beyond our classroom. Besides having children and a job sure to tire her out, one that might eventually give her varicose veins like my best friend Angie's mother who stands and works finding books, I have no clue what else a woman might do. I try a quick survey of TV characters for ideas about what women do beyond caring for their families, and when nothing comes, I think of my own mother who has worked in factories and shop floors and in the basement of Rochester General Hospital, scrubbing down surgical trays. Though she seems grateful for work and tries to make it sound like an adventure, I know she never wanted such a job, but one thing led to another, and there she was, spraying off scalpels and suction devices. I think of the few fathers I know, men with better versions of the same jobs, then consider the most well-off families, people who left the neighborhood after landing production jobs at Kodak or Rochester Products. But even with the steady paychecks and annual bonuses allowing them to finance houses in the western suburbs, I understand that these are not the careers we're meant to write. I look at the back of Rachel Zazzo's head, her ponytail moving as she writes, and wish for the first time I could steal another person's answer. If I were in the class next door, I'd write Hula Dancer as my career goal, and the teacher would stand beside me as a tropical shirt and pat my head with a sun-spotted hand, something blooming in me under such a touch. But that's next door. In our classroom, Mr. Coyle shifts his weight, the second vowel of his last name waving like a silent flag as he once again begins to strum the pencil against his hand. Think of what you most enjoy, he'd advised earlier. But my mind swirls with questions about why some vowels bounce and others don't, and how sweet the air surrounding Savoy is on Saturdays. And then it comes to me. What I most enjoy is checking out books from the Sully Branch Library, taking them home, and reading them under a tent made of blanket and knees. I'm partial to mysteries and travel books, but can't get enough Greek mythology. The thrill of Athena bursting out of her father's head, the fully clothed answer to a headache. The story of a nymph so in love with Apollo, she sits staring into the sun until the gods take pity and turn her into a sunflower. Arachne, the overproud weaver, comparing herself to the gods. I like nothing better than to sit inside my blue blanket tent, taking in stories of golden apples and pomegranates and unexpected transformations. So far removed from anything I know, but familiar too, the unpredictability of the gods and the longing of mortals. And just like that, I make up my mind about my career, mythologist. I've never heard of the job before, but I remember what Mr. Coyle said. You can do anything. Don't limit yourselves. So I write it down, and it looks good on the page, the way it ends in ologist, like something a person might need to go to college to study. I check the spelling and prepare myself for the shine in Mr. Coyle's face, the one that comes when he takes my paper and holds it up as an example to the rest of the class, the pain of so many eyes on me mingled with the thrill of having my work publicly praised. When I'm finally prepared for the terrible and wondrous flare of attention, I look up. Only instead of shine, there's something new in Mr. Coyle's face. His eyes are a thick squint. He's removed his glasses and rubs his lids, as if the entire state of Hawaii with all its sun has come into the room and blinded him temporarily. He tilts his head, then straightens himself with a jerk, the way people do when falling in dreams. Mr. Coyle doesn't touch my paper, doesn't lift it to the class, saying, listen to this, boys and girls. He only returns his glasses to his face and says, 
Well now, that's a new one. <laughs> he smiles, but the way he says it, his surprise, well now, tells me that mythology is no kind of career. I listen as other kids take turns reading their answers, voices trumpeting intentions to be fashion models, astronauts, the next Michael Jackson. Their goals sound impossible, but must be correct because they include no job anyone I know has ever done. You can do anything, our teacher had said. Mr. Coyle doesn't teach us how to hula, nor wear shirts teeming with exotic flowers, but he does drive a bright green Volkswagen bug and even beeps at us sometimes. He's strict, too strict, some say. But while I enjoy all the reading he assigns and the occasional games of heads up, seven up, it's the easy order of his class that lets me love my time there. But saying we can do anything? It seems too large to be true, too wide to pin down. I cover the word mythologist with a hand and listen to other kids read their goals, trying my best to think of another career, music, long gone goddesses, and the tender cycling of the world. So I started with this piece uh, because I think this question of like what can we do in the world is something that we all probably remember being asked or have, you know we had to deal with and still deal with I still deal with that what am I going to do in the world and um, so much of uh, many of the essays that follow uh, I'm going to read mainly from childhood but the ones that come later as a young woman and dealing with fertility and marriage and careers those sort of things all sort of are rooted in this this question and uh, while I focus on the experience of women and look at feminine models uh, I, I certainly hope that um, male readers will relate to it as well. And I just want to say that the other day at Canandaigua, uh, before the reading, there was a writing workshop that met in the library. It was wonderful to meet with that small group. And one of the one of the guys, name, the only guy, actually, it was all women, and this one man sitting down the center. So I was looking straight at him, and his name tag said, Mr. Coyle. <laughs> Well, it, but the thing is, it's not even Coyle. I changed the name, but I suddenly was like, is, could that be? He was the right age, and, and then he, he said, he said, I knew the priest you had growing up. So the whole time I was like, that's my teacher, you know? And, and when, I, when I read that thing about the green Volkswagen, I thought, why did I put that in there? If Mr. Coyle is, he was going to know he's, but anyway. Um, so the next piece I'm going to read, actually, I wasn't sure I was going to read this one, but Joe Flaherty gave me some good information that I'll share with you after the reading, and so I'm going to going to read Our Lady of the Lakes, and it's <clears throat> it's in uh, like I say I look at feminine role models, and these were you know include the prettiest girl on the street or teachers Susan B. Anthony, uh, the Virgin Mary statue at church, just any sort of woman. I was look I think girls look we do that right? we look at women we look at these models, but I also include people who aren't real, and so one of them is uh, the woman on the side of the. Land O'Lakes butter box, and so I'll read that now. How we longed to see her, hoping, even praying sometimes for her to appear. But then our greed was nothing new, especially where groceries were concerned. On shopping days, a dozen hands pawed the insides of brown paper bags, touching the surface of things, blessing the potatoes with our longing, placing our palms upon cartons of eggs and bags of flour. Those shopping days were like a holiday to a fa family of seven children. The oldest or most jaded among us might suck our teeth and make wisecracks about the abundance of generic labels and the same old sacks of rice, but it was merely posturing. The giddiness infected us all, brightened even the cracked linoleum floor, and persisted beyond the unpacking of food, everything in the house temporarily overflowing. But even then, in the highness of those grocery days, it would have been tempting fate to expect her. It would have been wanting too much and foolish besides because my mother usually bought off-brand or God forbid margarine, and we were, in fact, most often deprived of her. Still, there were times when she'd appear in the bottom corner of a bag, hidden among canned corn or bags of puffed wheat, astonishing as a box of Pop-Tarts, wondrous as name-brand sugar cereal, there she was, on a package of butter, an Indian maiden kneeling in the grass, the blue of lakes and sky converging behind her, accompanied by flowers and pine trees and sometimes cows. The design of the box changed over time, but the maiden always wore a buckskin dress and beaded belt. Always her hair was raven and lit with feathers, 
Always, she held a box of sweet cream butter in her hands, presenting it with such reverence that the very idea of butter became something of a religious offering. With her fair skin and rosebud mouth, she didn't look like any Indian maiden we'd ever known, and we'd known plenty during our time on the reservation near Buffalo, women with golden skin and smiles ten times wider than the woman kneeling in the meadow. But who could be picky where butter boxes were concerned? Maidens were big in the 1970s, the culture helping itself to headbands and beadwork, but feeling progressive because people had learned not to say squaw. Other than a fascination with Muhammad Ali, the Bermuda Triangle, and the general rise in the popularity of horror films, nothing marks my early childhood so much as a distorted affection for all things native. The package itself was an achievement for the way the maiden held in her hands a replica of the very same carton on which she appeared, so that the entire image, maiden in lake and pines, were repeated ad infinitum, the girl in her butter box continuing forever. But the endless loop of butter and maiden was simply an added bonus. The magic of recursive packaging, while captivating, was not why she mattered. No, the real trick was her knees. The shine of the exposed caps, the gleam of them, the way they flashed flesh and reflected light in just the right places. And more than that, the way the perfect beads of her knees provided a secret revealed only to those wise in the ways of butter packaging. Some used a razor to cut away the square surrounding her kneecaps, a small patch of cardboard which was lifted and pasted onto the maiden's chest. We were less brutal not because we were kind, but because we were children with limited access to razors and too impatient to mess with scissors or glue. We'd slip the sticks of butter from the box as soon as the groceries were unloaded, erupting into fights over the cardboard panels, eventually divvying them between the siblings or cousins, taking turns folding the package the way we'd learned to do, bringing the maiden's knees up to her chest, transforming the exposed caps into a stunning pair of breasts the polished divots looking for all the world like perfectly bronzed nipples. You would have thought that the secrets of the universe were unfolded for how often we bent that carton back and forth, hundreds of times, and as often as we could, until the crease gave way and the bottom half broke off, the maiden's legs forever severed from the rest of her body. It was something like magic to witness the change from butter-bearing beauty to bare-breasted woman. There was a certain thrill in turning everyday body parts into the most private parts, and a real respect for the power of a few folds to render something as solid as butter packaging into low-grade pornography. She was an object, Our Lady of the Lakes. But even as we coveted her image, my sisters and I knew better than to be impressed by such a Barbie doll version of a native girl or any girl. We must have questioned the reality of someone kneeling in greenery while happily offering up her dairy, and would eventually become disillusioned by the fact of women's bodies, ankles and faces and breasts being used to sell products since the very idea of product came into being. Still and all, I can't help but think of her knees every time I pass her in the grocery cooler, how she knelt on them, what we did to them, where all these years later she still waits stacked into tidy rows and smiling sweetly while holding out a box of butter, making offerings of herself for as far and as long as the eye can see. I think nobody in this group did that. No. Oh, two are going to admit it. Okay. Well, I will inform you for regional pride that that's a Rochester thing. When I've read in other places, people really do not get what I'm talking about. It's, it gets, re it's really uncomfortable, so glad a few of you admitted it. Uh, so the, the next piece is uh, called Copias, and it looks at an everyday icon, I guess, uh, a bride, and the, the title copia is, is a Spanish word that means favor, a wedding favor, and so they're just little favors that you get at a wedding, you get at many weddings these favors, but they're Jordan almonds or something, or the, uh, the bride's uh, and the groom's names and the wedding date, and I explain that in the essay, but I also want to say that this is set at Corpus Christi Church, and the thing to know about it is that Back then and even now, the church has English mass and Spanish mass, and those communities are pretty uh, distinct. They, they, they sort of don't know each other beyond the group, which is, I don't know why I'm talking about 
the politics of churches, but it's important to know that uh, this takes place in the Spanish community. So while I was a parishioner at the church, uh, this is at Spanish Mass. Copias. Here she comes now, la novia, the bride, and how everyone turns to stare. My God, mira su traje, Look at the sight of her gown and que hermosa, how lovely, as she points a satin shoe in our direction and steps into view, this bride from 30 years gone by. She'll have children by now, our bride, grandchildren perhaps, but not yet, not in this moment where she stands before the altar, a line of saints watching from beneath the panel of stained glass. Her back is to us, pearls running down the length of her gown, train puddled at her feet, the runner like snow upon the aisle, girls in chiffon dresses at her side. She's skinny, this bride, her bronze clavicles making knives just under the lace. But this is a wedding, and everything swells with the day so that her body ripens as she stands before us. She was always pretty with her pocket full of sharp features, but on this day, light shows in her face as she walks down the center aisle of Corpus Christi and stands before the Padre, whose Spanish has never been perfected, but whose kindness burns in his wide Irish face. And I, Dios mio, look at the groom, compact and good looking, tucks and new shoes, the whole of him decked out in white the way men used to do the way he nearly bursts with pride as she reaches his side, until fading away, until only she remains. And it's the bride we look for anyway. When wedding parties emerge from churches, the flash of white, there she is, we say, something starting in us. The bride, I say, oh look, I've seen her beside the pink chapel in Midtown Memphis, under lilacs at Highland Park, and gathering jasmine in the garden of the Alcazar in Sevilla, the bride, an ordinary woman making silk of just one day, the beginning, like all beginnings, belonging to more than just herself. But back to our bride, la novia tan hermosa, and the way she lets go of her flowers in the church hall after mass, the way she dances with her new groom, a slow song, something rising between them, burning beneath the satin, but not so much that she can't stand to dance with her father in the line of other men who slip folded bills into the purse tied to her waist. It's 1980s in western New York, and there's nothing shameful about a dollar dance. All we see is how well she dances, the way she becomes a sweep of lace with every turn, each man taken in for a few seconds, then spun away as the next arrives. Now she's dancing with someone from the band, the conga player or the singer who holds a guiro in one hand, the metal pua in the other, making sounds the body knows better than words. Everyone joins the dance. Children wiggle narrow hips between chugs of cold maltas and sips of pina coladas. These are Puerto Rican families. Salsas and merengues are as natural as bottles of rum and the bride's best favors made by her mother and sisters. Charms surrounded by bits of satin and tulle miniature corsages bearing the couple's names and wedding date. Our bride takes a break and carries her copias in a basket, pinning one to each female guest, bending into ladies too old to rise, kissing them once on the cheek, bendicion, she says, asking for a blessing and giving another kiss at their reply, que Dios te bendiga mi niña, may God bless you, my child. She moves on. The number of copias dwindling as she approaches, but what's this? A white child at her wedding. Other than the priest who's already returned to the rectory, the girl's the only Blanca in the crowd. Oh yes, she recognizes her now, the one always with the Rosas girls, Wandi and Sadi and Maritza. We both wonder whether she should pin one to me, this girl who has somehow landed at her reception, but here it comes, a bit of lace stuck to my dress just enough to comprehend some of what it means to be a bride, the lightness and grace, the moment suspended, a respite from the daily business of living, if only for a few hours. La novia, not so much a person as a condition, wrapped in white and handing out favors. What does she say as she pins it? I'm not old enough to be asked to give a blessing, not fluent enough to ask to receive one. She probably says, thank you for coming, and maybe I know enough to mumble congratulations as I touch the bit of plumage from her basket. We stand together, a strange child at a wedding and a bride with her basket of copias. How fast it will go, 30 years. 
the gown gone ivory, the rasp of instruments fading into the hum of tree frogs, but not yet. Let us stay a little longer in the basement of Corpus Christi Church for the beer and the pasteles and the sound of the band starting up. This time it's an old song and the ladies sigh while I let my fingers leave the copy up pinned to my dress and run to find my friends and beg a share of cake. The day is still before us and ay, Dios mio, what a beautiful bride. And yes, que todos estamos bendecidos. We are, each of us, in this moment, blessed. Um, so just two samples of sort of women that I look at or uh, models. And this, I, I hadn't read that before because there's Spanish in there. And it's, it's easy to write a second language. But when you have to read it out loud, it presents <laughs> challenges. But I think I'm getting brave, because now I'm reading it, I'm like, well, oh, thank you, thank you. Well, that, that's all a setup, because I'm actually gonna read, I had a new book come out, I guess two days ago now, and I have a very short piece from that that I'm gonna read because it's St. Patrick's Day. And uh, it's a, uh, this book is uh, also inspired by women, but they're women I never knew. So unlike this bride or the, well, I didn't know the maiden on the butter box, but I felt like I knew her. <laughs> she was a part of my life. But these women are, are people I just never knew, but I heard their stories. And so they're, they're historical cases of women who just lived in, an, in an, uh, sort of a fascinating way. This particular piece is a little different. It came as a result of my researching my family tree on my father's side. I don't know my father's side of the family, but I know they have a French Canadian name. And so I started to do research to find out where they were from in Quebec and, and all of that. Um, and I found a, a Mary Doyle on the family tree in, uh, from County Mayo. And I thought, wow, what's that? So uh, I started to research her as well, like I did these other women. But in the case of Mary Doyle, I found as I looked for her, because I thought, oh, Mary Doyle from County Mayo, I'll just look her right up on the internet, you know? But it turns out there were lots of Mary Doyles leaving Ireland, you know, in the late 19th century. And I was astounded when I looked at the church records of these women, Mary Doyle, Mary, I mean, just the name repeating over and over, leaving for America, all of these women leaving for America. And people had been coming to America for a long time, but the, the Irish were a special group in that many young women left. There were just no husbands or jobs, so they left. So this piece, um, I'll read, and if anybody here uh, has any knowledge of Irish name places, I beg your forgiveness, because I am going to butcher them. Um, <laughs> And I'll also say that, I'll just announce now that I'm gonna be, I, the book came out a couple days ago, but I'm not launching it for a while and I'll be back on May 21st to actually do a reading here, the first local reading here uh, at, uh, at the library. And I think we're gonna be out in the gorgeous garden is what I hear, so um, that's May 21st at 2.30 and I'm sure you'll hear more about it. So here is a thousand Mary Doyles. There she is, Mary Doyle and another right beside her, head turned for one last view of land before the court coastline slips out of sight. Dishwater strands pushed behind her ears, yellow curls pulled up under a hat, dark frizz flying in the wind. She is 17, she is 22, she is just yesterday turned 29. Look at her now studying the sky in place of crying, trying to remember what everyone has said begging Mary, the most mo holy mother of God, they might make it across the ocean alive. She leaves behind her favorite cow in the kitchen garden she's been fighting for years. She leaves behind her mother's grave, her sister's face, and her uncle Timo's way with the plow. She leaves behind the traveling priest, the Sunday masses, and the words to every song she knows, the pretty laments and the keening, and Mr. Byrne with a tin whistle, and here it comes now, her father's hand, swollen and cracked as it is, the way he held it to her, her father's hand, soft as old cloth against her cheek. She leaves behind the big house on the hill and the broken buggy leaning against Coughlin's cottage, will it, oh will it, ever get fixed? And the marsh violet and the burnet rose and the black thorn too sometimes, the patchwork of fields, and the baby Lizzie with her dark eyes and funny ways, what will the little one be like as she grows? And the abbey, of course, what times they had there, the sick, slick moss and the cold stone, 
and her best friend Bertie, who swears upon her life she will write, but both girls know how these things go. A few long letters at first, the distance between them widening as the world settles into the spaces made by those who leave until words are folded less often into envelopes. Because if there's one thing everyone knows, it's that when someone leaves Ballyhowness, sure enough, she's gone for good. Mary Doyle, come from Moy Cullen, from Westmeath, from Usher's Key, come from Poolnamook, Guisalia, and Turmakiti, from Clangeen, Kaluni, and Kahermakria, from Kilkelly, Kilmina, Balina, and Common from Dunamore, Dunlahair, and Drogheda. That one there with the reddish hair, the tall one with the overproud back, the one gone flat against the rail, trying her best to hide the sight of a broken shoe under her trunk, fan of fingers placed on her brow. That one, and that one, and then again that one too. Sailed in 1851, sailed in 1847, left from Queenstown in 1869, doing what she must in order to survive. See her now stepping from the gangway, swaying a bit as her feet reach solid land. That's her there scanning the crowd for the sight of a familiar face. And here we are. We can't call out, but we can at least see her, every girl bound for Boston, New York, and the upper St. Lawrence. We can't call out, but we can look for a moment in her direction to see what might be find of us, found of us in her face. For she belongs to all of us, does our girl, Mary Doyle. And that's the last one I'll read for, for now. Thank you for your attention. I welcome your questions about writing or the book or, I don't know, anything you have questions about. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, with different poems or like objects or mm -hmm. scattered throughout. Mm -hmm. um, and diaries are kind of like self-indulgence. Okay. Um, so my question to you is with that format in mind, what is kind of your brainstorming or writing process? Um, well, uh, well, I think they're a diary in that, um, well, I guess how I think of diary is keeping track of daily events, sort of, but I guess everybody some people journal, right? But I think what those things have in common is using writing as a way to sort of either organize or make sense of things that ha have happened. Um, and that line that you read talks about my tendency to want to do that, to sort of re, uh, to, to look at things again and again and say why that is, which is rumination, which can be self-indulgent, and uh, which is the criticism that memoir gets. So I, I try to avoid that. But um, my process is a lot like that. Like I will have a particular thing really hit me, whether it's um, this bride from so long ago, or the memory of the teacher saying, what is it that you want to be when you grow up? Or even the idea of uh, this Irish ancestor and trying to find her and realizing how many of them existed. Uh, so I, I sort of think about it and uh, sort of not meditate but I'm ruminating using words and I think I often through writing discover something larger than the initial impulse that's what I hope for anyway what I hope is that in examination of that image or memory or idea or question that I'll arrive at a place that uh, is larger than me and that beckons the reader in. So in the case of this Mary Doyle one, um, I start with my Mary Doyle, but I realize so quickly it doesn't even matter about my Mary Doyle. I think at the time that I was writing this, there was a more talk, although there's talk about that wall along the southern border now, but there was really talk about that and immigration and a friend of mine, Elizabeth Osta, had just written a book about her Irish ancestor. So all those things came to a head in the essay, but I hope that by the end it opens up to be a wider uh, invitation to the reader than just my rumination. But great question. I just kind of want to, my comments yeah. about bouncing off the previous question, mm -hmm. which is that um, yeah, it says right on the book, a memoir. Of yeah. Madison. And when I read the book, I felt like, well, this is different from my experience with memoirs. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, 
I'm sorry, I don't remember the gentleman's name, and I know I should know, but it wasn't like. Um, Joe Flaherty. Oh, Joe Flaherty. Yeah. Okay. So um, he made a comment about how this is a collection of personal essays. Yes. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's like a perfect Yeah. Yes, it is. And I think a couple things are at work. Um, just now, essay collections are becoming very popular. There have been several in the past couple of years. Roxane Gay has Bad Feminist and Leslie Jameson wrote. There's some really amazing essay collections and um, people, people, commercial presses actually want to buy them now, which is new. It's unheard of. And the reading public, as a result, is getting a little more comfortable with the idea of essay. I think in the past, the word essay wasn't appealing to readers. It reminded them of ninth grade, and they didn't want anything to do with it. So I think uh, marketing departments uh, choose to call something memoir and in, in these essays really are memoir essays but they the press made the decision to call it a memoir it would have been more accurate to call it a memoir in essays yeah yes you seem to have pulled yourself out of poverty yeah do you attribute that to a one particular mentor particularly a woman mentor I had so many good influences. Not one particular. I mean, definitely different people at different times have stood out. I think I've looked for that person. I think as a young, as a girl, it was always a mother figure, you know, a mother figure. Um, so they were teachers. Uh, they were really nice people at my church who were just loving to me. Um, they were writers sometimes. So uh, there have been really important people. Um, it behind, there's, I, I'm sorry, Gail Ma, I always embarrass you, but my mother-in-law is here right behind you, and she's one that really inspires me. Um, but lots of them. My sister, I mean, just, I, I think, I think like everyone, we find what we need where, you know, wherever we can get it. And so I, I certainly was looking for people to give me new information about how to be in the world, and people generously did. So it was great. I thought I saw a hand over here. Yes. Bit about the transition you made into becoming a writer. So you uh, you went to college and you became a social worker, mm -hmm. and then uh, and you transit. Uh, you mentioned the that the first thing you did was take a, a course at Writers and Books. Right. How did that um, How did that journey proceed? And um, did, and did you eventually you know get an agent and yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'll, that's an easy question. <laughs> but I'll, I'll say that um, I was just talking to Joe about this. The first class I took at Writers and Books, I don't remember exactly how old I was, but I think I was in my mid twenties and knew I liked writing and wanted to experiment, you know, see what what was up. And so I went there and. The people in the first class I ever took were so enthusiastic about what I'd written. It was a scene involving wanting Cher, the singer Cher, to be my mother. So you see, I got it where I could. The Butterbox Cher. And people were like, oh, that's really good. And it scared me. They were so enthusiastic that I left that class and never came back. But I eventually, because um, I didn't like attention in that way, right? So, um, I, but I eventually came back and took other classes. And here's what I did. I, I made sure that I had a solid career with a regular paycheck in a house before I let myself go down that path. I think because of the way that I grew up, I just was too scared to let myself get into something that might not pay me regularly. I was afraid of art and writing. So eventually, after I did have a job as a school counselor, uh, I went and took classes at the college level. The first one out in uh, SUNY Brockport with Judith Kitchen, which was fate. It was just amazing. She was very important to me, and I write about her in the book. Um, and eventually went and uh, did a, a creative writing degree and wrote my first book. I do have an agent. Um, he, how I know essay collections are so popular is he just sent an email saying he was a little hurt that I didn't use him to, to, to publish the last one. Uh, and I said, well, it's literary essays and tried to make him feel better. And he said, well, those are really, you know, we really want them now. But um, he, so I have an agent. I haven't really had to use that agent much. I'm writing fiction now and I think maybe uh, he'll be, he'll come in handy more. So I think in your question you're asking about, you know, like how to be successful as a writer, I think it just depends on what you're trying to do and, um, you know, uh, what, what you're publishing for. So there's a lot, there's a lot there. Other questions? Yes. Um, um, you write about some personal things. Mm -hmm. And um, for myself, the idea of writing and anyone seeing it, like, mm -hmm. um, 
has that been challenging for you? Has that been something? I mean, you know, you're standing here, people know personal things. I know. What is that like? Well, I think I'm delusional or something. You know, like I think I delude myself a lot. So, and that helps actually as a writer because I often don't even think about the fact that somebody's going to be reading this until it's published. And then it does feel a little strange and in a good way and in a scary way. For instance, all of Rochester Reads, wonderful. You know, it's a wonderful opportunity, but it is, it's a little, it's, it's even, you know, it's a little different than reading in another city, right? Because there are going to be people I maybe know in the audience, that sort of thing. Um, so it's uncomfortable. I will say that I, uh, I believe so much in telling people stories, not just for the sake of telling them, but as a way to connect with others. Uh, so for instance, some of the, I think some of the most personal essays in that, in Queen of the Fall, have to do with fertility and um, pregnancy loss. And that is a tender topic, no doubt about it. Those were hard to write, and I haven't even really read, read them very often out loud. But after every reading, at least someone comes up to me and says, Thank you, because I went through that and I didn't. I've never read about that, or you know. So um, the the part of writing memoir or personal essay that moves me beyond personal expression is that connection. And you know, women are great readers and great writers, but we don't often read about the, some of the challenges that women go through in a way that is considered literature. And so. Um, I don't even know how this. Oh yes, the the like. How could I write? Um, I think it's important enough that I, I'm, I'm happy to do it. And as I get older, I have less shame, which is so, it's so nice. Maybe, maybe I should have shame. Like, why did I put this on, you know? But other questions? Yes, and then I'll go to the back. Um, I just, I have a comment, and that is that I think your reading is really important. Because I think you have a voice in your book. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And, um, <coughs> Mm-hmm. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yes? A uh, comment and then a uh, question. Your original first reading on what you want to be mm-hmm. isn't just for children. I'm finding at the age of almost 70, mm-hmm. I have the privilege in my life to kind of re-ask that question. Mm-hmm. And um, so it is, it's a wonderful question to, to pose. Oh, great, great. Um, the question I have is, you are, have been to a lot of audiences of students mm-hmm. and a lot of younger people in the last few weeks. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering what that's like for you and, and are there some common responses and questions and things that come up with the young audience? Yeah, you know, we. The audiences have been pretty mixed, actually, and I'm trying to think if there have been common responses. It is interesting to me, and this is the most common, so I'll say it again, that after the reading, almost always somebody talks about fertility. And so that is consistent across every every reading, not just here in Rochester, and, and whispers it. So I know it's a loaded topic still. But um, you know, people are really interested in writing about our region um, in the essay as a form, or some people are interested in <clears throat> sort of what they see as using poetic language in prose. So those kind of questions come up. Can you, Joe, can you think of any other questions? I can't think of regular questions. People are great readers and have very thoughtful questions, but they've varied a little bit depending on where we are. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, I think the biggest, it's trust for me, you know, like it's hard work, it's not hard work like bricklaying hard work, but it's, it can be hard to, for me anyway, to write an essay and to stick with it. Um, the writing process, even though I start with that image or idea and then I go to the typewriter or computer, it's not like it just comes out. I have to go back and try to, um, make something of it, I guess. And that's hard. That's the part that's really so hard, I think, to a lot of creative people, but especially for me. I want to do everything else in the world but that. I want to suddenly do the dishes, or uh, (laughs) suddenly I need to exercise. You know, like every other thing is now a possibility. And so for me, it's just the sticking with it 
and the trust, and I see this with my students, they're so worked up about what they're writing. Is anybody gonna wanna read this? Is this interesting? Do I really, you know, how does this fit into my, you know, overall plan? And, and so much of it is just letting go of that and going with it, which I think is life in a lot of ways, but it's trusting. So even once you get to the end of that one piece, whether it's an essay or a poem or a story, it's, you know, the, the normal question is, well, now what am I gonna do with this? Now what's the rest of the book gonna be? Because society pushes us toward that, right? But the truth is like, no, you're still gonna trust because you're gonna find out what you care about and write it, at least for nonfiction anyway. So um, if you have concrete questions, I'm happy to answer them. And I don't mean to sort of gloss over the, the work of it, which is showing up and writing, but I think so much of it is trusting that what you care about matters, what you remember matters, and that you keep going and something will come of it. Just when you think nothing's gonna come of it, something will come of it. Yes? I'd like to ask you, to, I'd like to know about the cover. Is that a P and I'd like to know about the title. Okay. Our, our book club had, somebody had a really good theory on the title. Okay. Um, it is a P and &E, and the title is, um, the t title was a compromise because the original title was Land of the Lost, which was the title of the first essay. And the press didn't like that title, so we worked to find another one and looked at um, heirloom apple varieties and used that. And um, uh, Queen of the Fall, how I see it is the idea of looking at women, queen is you know feminine, and then th also uh, the idea of falling and what it means to fall, because the book has a lot of, uh, looks at loss and joy and how those two things are necessary to each other in some ways. I think that's probably a big thing that happens in almost every essay. So the idea of falling, but somebody in another, several people now have pointed out to me that I'm in the fall of my life, which I did not know until I got back here. <laughs> um, so I guess, I don't know, I guess it's the, I, you know, I resisted it, but then I did the math, and I'm like, actually, I might. Yeah, I'm not in the summer. Maybe late summer. <laughs> but, so I think the idea of fall and, and looking back at our lives and certainly being at the end of possibility for having children. And so in that way, sort of looking back at decisions and what it has meant uh, to, to be fruitful or not fruitful in that way. So do you want to say what your book club thought? <laughs> well, Mary made this observation like that. I said, oh yeah, I see it. The, I, you feel like that Greek myth, that you know, rolling the rock up and you know, the fertility, mm -hmm. you just got to this point and said, that's it. Yeah. But even your best friend, I mean, the beautiful best friend, that she, mm -hmm. I mean, she influenced you, and she, she had this potential, and she, Yes, and, yes. So that, that sense of, oh, yeah. yeah. Which I think everyone experiences in different ways. Mm -hmm. There are different characters through them. Yes, in, in the part I didn't read, which I had been reading, is the opening with the apple trees where I have the memory and talk about the nature of memory, but then Eve pops up and uh, I talk about her falling from you know, having to leave paradise. So yeah, I think all of those things go into the mood of the title. Uh, but again, the press, your publisher for the most part chooses title and cover image. And I would say this, my sister always looks at me and says, what family did you look at? Because I tend to Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's so fascinating to me what people remember and why. And you know, some people get really upset in memoir that it's not fact. You know, what was they would like to know exactly what happened and. I do too, but I'm really interested in why we remember and how we remember. And some of it is who we are as people, what we tune into. But sometimes it's just as simple as my sister, who's actually right behind you, being a year and a half older, so she had different information. So sometimes it's really just that, you know, like what we tune into. And I don't know how we're doing on time. I'm sorry, I have not been keeping track. How are we on time for questions? Can we do more? Okay, um, more questions. Yes. I 